Good morning and welcome to the May edition of the Maine Forest Service Forestry Friday series. My name is Jan Santerre and I am the program coordinator for Project Canopy, which is Maine's urban and community forestry program. Uh, we're going to get started right on time here in order to make sure that we give our featured speaker um, a lot of time and leave plenty of time for questions at the end because I know um, you're all going to be really engaged and have all sorts of questions. Um, <clears throat> so Project Canopy is the host for the monthly series of the Maine Forest Service this month as uh, we celebrate Maine's Arbor Week. Project Canopy is the state's urban and community forestry program and serves to provide means nearly 500 cities and towns along with nonprofit groups and school institutions with public shade tree and forest education as well as technical and financial assistance for the management of public trees and forests so we thought it fitting to um, close out Maine's arbor week where we annually celebrate our trees and forests and the contributions that they bring to our social, environmental and economic well-being um, to focus this monthly program on tree planting and efforts to increase tree health um, for uh, new shade tree and other types of, of tree plantings. Before I introduce our speaker, just a few quick housekeeping items. Um, one. First, remember to mute your microphones. If you don't do it, we will. Um, you can also feel free to turn your cameras off uh, for some who don't have uh, the, the um, fast speeds. It helps to pre preserve bandwidth. Um, it's not a requirement, but you can feel free to do so. Um, we will be using the chat box feature, um, which is up, should be at the top of your screen. It's the little um, thought bubble. Um, and you can ask your questions during Anne's presentation. I'm getting some feedback. And we will address them in the order that they came in. Uh, if you wish, you can also hold your questions until the end of the presentation and use your uh, raise hand feature, which I believe is next to the, the thought bubble under reactions. You can raise your hand and we will call on you at the end of the program and you can uh, unmute yourself and ask your question at that time. So I believe that's the, the end of the housekeeping. Um, so it is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Ann Pringle as our May Forestry Friday speaker. Dr. Pringle is a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She obtained her bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Chicago in 1993 and completed her doctoral degree in botany and genetics at Duke University in 2001. Dr. Pringle continued her postdoctoral training as a Miller Fellow at the University of California, Berkeley, where she began her work with the death cap fungus. In 2005, she joined the Organismic and Evolutionary Biology Department at Harvard University. Uh, for her passions towards scientific teaching and mentoring, she was awarded the Harvard University, uh, at Harvard University, the Fanny Cox Prize for Excellence in science teaching and the Mendelssohn Excellence and Mentoring Award. In 2015, Pringle moved to the University of Wisconsin, where she continues studying the complex kingdom of fungi. Her work has been featured in National Geographic, the New York Times, National Public Radio, and other uh, national um, venues. Uh, you can learn about Dr. Pringle's research at the Pringle Lab website, which I have put a link to in the chat. And you can also see other featured uh, programs at the iBiology website, also linked in the chat. And we'll continue to post those um, in case you can't access them. So I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Ann Pringle, for joining us this morning to discuss mycorrhizal relationships and shade tree vigor. Thank you. Can everyone hear me OK? I mean, I assume that someone will tell me and interrupt me if there's any kind of uh, issue with hearing me. So thanks so much for having me. I'm going to talk about a problem that is not top of mind uh, for foresters or biologists or uh, conservation biologists or people who care about the planet. And it's not top of mind because fungi are not uh, often taught in schools. I'm going to guess for a lot of people here, you didn't 
even have a single class about kingdom fungi when you were in high school and maybe you heard about them in, in at uh, university or maybe you didn't it, i find that it's a kingdom that um people are intrigued by they don't know a lot about it um, because they don't know a lot about it there's there's a there's a, a lot of um there are a lot of things happening in our world related to fungi that people don't know about. Although it's also true that lately they've been getting a, a bit more press than um, they ever have in my entire career um, with books like Entangled Life and movies like Fantastic Fungi. Anyway, so I want to talk to you about a problem that you may not know about, and it's really it's directly relevant to people planting trees. And I just started my timer, so I will um, know how much time I'm talking. So let me back up a bit and let me talk about um, why we understand that this group of fungi that we call the mycorrhizal fungi, and mycorrhizal simply means fungus root. Myco means fungus and rhizal means root. Um, so the mycorrhizal fungi are the fungi that form associations with plant roots. And there's a general sense now in the public, and, and maybe you've heard that mycorrhizal fungi are good. Why do we think that mycorrhizal fungi are good for plants? It's because of experiments like the one you're looking at now. This is actually one of the experiments that I did for my own PhD long ago. And I've nicknamed um, these experiments the big plant, little plant experiment. And these kinds of experiments have by now been replicated hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of times. It's very robust. And here's how it works. You grow a bunch of plants with fungi and you grow them without fungi and you grow the plants with different species of fungi. And when you do that, in general, what you find is that the control plants without the fungi don't grow as well as the plants that you're growing with fungi. So on your screen, you'll see two plants that are growing with a fungus called Acalospora melia. They are clearly much bigger. Interestingly, also, interestingly, they're also yellower, which you probably notice, suggesting a nutrient deficiency. Um, but they're uh, probably because they're bigger and they've pulled all the nutrients out of that little pot. Um, and on the on the on the left of my screen, and I hope your screen, you'll see these control plants that don't have fungi and they grow differently. So in a controlled experiment, you, you, you there are dramatic differences between no fungi or with fungi. And um, that's also true, not just so these are Plantago lanceolata or Englishman's foot. This is a weed that I know you have all around you in Maine. You walk on it on lawns all the time. Maybe you pull it out of your own lawn. Um, and so, so it's so this this dynamic of growing better with fungi is true for plants like this, but it's also true for trees. So here you're looking at oaks that are growing with mycorrhizal fungi. In this case, the mycorrhizal fungi are truffles, um, the famous truffles that um, you you may like to to eat on eggs, etc. So the oaks with the truffles are clearly with the truffle fungi are clearly bigger and healthier. But in fact, they're alive, um, whereas the ones without fungi don't look very good, and in many cases, they've died. So there just isn't any doubt that plants um, grow better with these mycorrhizal fungi. And because plants seem to grow better with these mycorrhizal fungi, there's an idea that it's an unqualified good to have mycorrhizal fungi, um, that we should just use them as much as possible all the time. They must be the perfect biotechnology. And that's really the idea I want to attack today and discuss. Um, so first of all, what I want to say is that when you're looking at the trees versus Englishman's foot, you're looking at two very distinct, totally different kinds of associations. One kind of association is the endomycorrhizal, or you're, you'll hear about it as arbuscular mycorrhizal, or AMF association and these are fungi in a in a phylum of the kingdom fungi that that penetrate plant cells so you're looking at a cross section of the root so they these fungi penetrate the plant cells they form structures that are called arbuscules or little little trees and this is the site where the fungus is bringing nutrients to the plant and the plant is um, giving carbon, excess photosynthate, to the fungus. So those kinds of associations are typical of Englishman's foots or grasses or your tomato plant. Um, those kinds of fungi will not associate with, with most trees. Trees typically associate with a different 
kind of um, a different class of fungi that are in a different phylum, different phyla. And these are the ectomycorrhizal or ECM fungi. And these have a very different growth pattern. They grow on the outside of the root. Um, they don't directly penetrate inside plant cells. So really what I want you to take away from this is that depending on what you're planting, tomatoes versus a pine tree, you, you, um, you're, you're the, the tree that you're planting or the plant that you're planting would associate with very different kinds of fungi. So it's no good putting ectomycorrhizal fungi on your tomato plants there will be no association, it won't work. So fungi are not a monolithic entity, it's a kingdom of a million, 10 million species, and all fungi are not equivalent to each other, they do different things in the environment. So now let me tell you a story about why these are not necessarily an unqualified good that we should just be sprinkling across planet Earth. And that this story is going to take us to New Zealand. Pine trees are not native to the southern hemisphere, which is interesting. And if you didn't know that and you're surprised, but the first time I heard about that, I was also surprised because you see pines all over the Southern Hemisphere, but you see them like this. This is not a natural planting, a natural forest. This is a, a plantation is what it's called, a forestry trees. And these trees are being planted. Um, why are they being planted? Um, well, that they're being planted because we need things like toilet paper, um, especially in the pandemic. This became a really funny um, punchline <laughs> when I gave this talk because we definitely needed toilet paper. So you plant trees to harvest them. They're a crop. Probably a lot of you in this audience are very super familiar with that. But when pine trees were first planted in the southern hemisphere, they did not grow. Um, there was a failure like those oak trees that you saw without the truffle fungi. And it was exactly that dynamic. Um, the, there were no pine-associated ectomycorrhizal fungi in the southern hemisphere. And so um, this is from a fantastic paper written by a guy named Mikola, who was traveling on behalf of the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. And he began to talk to foresters in places like South Africa. Um, and he would say, well, how did you eventually get the pine trees to grow? And they said, oh, well, you know, I talked to my friend in the Netherlands. And my friend in the Netherlands shipped me a tin of soil. This would have been in the 50s. Um, and sent me a box of soil. And when I sprinkled that soil on the pine trees, then the pine trees grew. And then after a while, I, I cultured that that soil and the pine trees worked. And then I, I sent some soil over to, you know, to Tanzania. Um, and so what Mikola did is uh, you're looking at the movement of soils that were specifically moved to get pines and other northern um, temperate tree species to grow in places like South Africa and all across the southern hemisphere. And so this is a deliberate introduction and movement of mycorrhizal fungi, although and actually this dynamic was critical to the discovery of mycorrhizal fungi um, and the discovery of what they were and what they were doing. At the time, foresters didn't exactly know what they were doing, but they knew that they were moving living soils and those living soils were helping the, the trees to grow. So it's a really fascinating story. So soils have been moved around specifically in this context and, and um, not surprisingly, um, lots of different fungi were introduced. So on the left, you're seeing genera of fungi. If, if anyone in the audience um, collects fungi, you'll recognize some of these names, Amanita, Boletus, which is the um, same genus as the Porcini mushroom, Rustula. These are all um, genera that you would have around you in your, in your main forest as well. Um, and so black is the number of species within the genus Amanita, for example. Um, that have been documented as introduced, and then the gray bars are the total number of introductions that um, my co-authors and I could find records of in the literature. So I want you to get a sense of a very dynamic, um, very dynamic dynamic, that's great English, um, where, where things are being moved across the globe a little bit willy-nilly just to get the trees to grow, no regard that there might be um, such thing as a native biodiversity of fungi or endemic fungi or no thought of invasions, just let's just spread the fungi around the planet and, and get the trees to grow. Um, and so this is the a global pattern of 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 what um, of of introduction. So green circles are proportionate to how many fungi have been introduced to a particular place. And you see, the southern hemisphere is is definitely a place where lots of fungi have been introduced. Brazil is quite prominent. Australia, New Zealand is incredibly prominent. South Africa. Um, and this is a relational database. If you are curious, you could download it and look for any country that you wanted, what species have been introduced there. And I really feel this is just the tip of the iceberg. 
these are just records that for um, for a variety of, of reasons were we could find in various places in literature. Uh, I think there are a lot of introductions that have gone undocumented. Um, but again, just this sense of dynamic movement, things are being moved around by people to get things to grow. Um, this is this is what's happening. Um, and unsurprisingly, um, then after being introduced to grow to help the pines to grow, for example, um, some fungi became invasive. And so this is an invasive species that I work with in California. And I want to just pause for a moment and talk about that word invasive, because I also find that there's a lot of strong opinions about when we should or should not use the word invasive. Um, I tend to be somewhat agnostic. I'm happy if people have strong definitions that they want to use. That's great. Um, there is no consensus about how to use that word, so I tend to not worry about it too much. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that we'll ever reach a consensus and I'm not sure it's practical to try. But if you are someone who's thinking, well, an in invasive species must be something that causes harm, it must be demonstrated to, to do damage, I would say that for the death cap, because it's it's deadly poisonous and kills people, um, it's pretty clearly a harm. Um, never mind what it's likely doing to the to the below ground biodiversity of, of soils in the forests where it's invading. And this is a poster that's put up in, in parks around California, or used to be, to try to warn people that the death cap Amanita phylloides was there, and that if you were coming to pick mushrooms to eat them, you should be aware that this deadly poisonous fungus is something that you might pick. And the poster is written in many different languages because quite often it's um, immigrants coming from Southeast Asia who are picking the mushroom, thinking it looks like a patty straw mushroom. Um, which is something that you might pick and eat, um, you know, for example, in um, in Southeast Asia. So um, so invasions are then a part of what happens. Um, and let me and it's not so for a long time, the death cap was kind of the the only story. There's not a lot of people doing the kind of work that I'm doing. It feels very painstaking and it feels a little bit lonely um, to be documenting this this um, biodiversity as it's changing across planet Earth in contrast to to um, people who study invasion biology of plants, for example, where there's thousands of people, tens of thousands of people in an enormous community. Um, I'm a little bit the lonely only in trying to say, hey, there are other kinds of biodiversity that are being moved around the planet. Um, but here's another story just, to, just to, to prove the point that the death cap is not unique. And now I'm taking you to Colombia in South America, which is the southernmost distribution of oaks on our planet. And we're high in the Andes, very, very high up in the mountains, which is where the oaks can live in Colombia. And you're looking at you're looking across a valley um, on, on, onto an oak forest. And if you go to these oak, oak forests, you rather shockingly find this um, mushroom. It's a very famous mushroom, Amanita muscaria, but it's not native to Colombia. It's a European fungus, so you should find it in the forest of Germany but you're up high in these um, South American mountains and you see this fungus. Um, and what we've come to discover is that, and, and on the map of Colombia that you're looking at, the green are places where we find the fungus um, growing in tree plantations. Um, so in often little small personal woodlots that people have, you know, I'm growing a, a few um, acacia trees for, you know, to harvest for, for my fireplace. Um, and so those are the green dots and then the blue, dot is um, is something somewhat of the holy grail of invasion biology. We think this is the place where this fungus uh, jumped from association from from associating with planted um, imported species of trees to the native oak Quercus humboldtii. Uh, and here's a here's a, a finer scale view of that where um, every dot represents a collection of mushrooms. And you can see, so um, Pinus patula is a Mexican species, not native to Colombia. Um, that's true for this acacia as well, acacia um, melanoxylon. Um, and you can see that these, these little patchy forests here are that are um, planted um, house muscaria, and then not too far away, we have the muscaria growing with um, Quercus humboldtii. So it's just very easy to see the ecological dynamic as the mushrooms pop up and shed their spores, the spores travel, um, and we're seeing the start of, start of a spread. It's very similar to what we saw, what we're seeing with the death cap in, in California. Um, and here's 
I just want to give credit um, to Natalia Vargas that you see in the orange jacket. This is us sampling. I did not Photoshop this image, even though these mushrooms look like they're not real <laughs> in this photo, I find. I promise you they're real. They're enormous. It's creepy. Um, it's very much feels like a wor world out of balance when you're up in these very high um, places where the condors fly, and then there's this European fungus popping up all over the place. Um, it's just a, a really kind of a surreal experience. And um, this is a, a beautiful analysis that Natalia did. What you're looking at, she was focused on South America. You're looking, you know, for example, at Brazil. You're looking at the extent of um, planted forests. That's what this line is here. Brazil has a lot of planted forests, and it also has a lot of introduced fungi. Um, so we can see it's it's just a, a, a data that reinforces this idea that the the extent to which you're planting forests and um, it, it, that is correlated. The amount of planted forest you have is correlated with the amount of, of fungal introductions that you have. Okay, so why isn't moving these, you know, um, these fungi are responsible for that big plant, little plant dynamic. They're good. How can it be bad to move these things around? And to understand why it's not an unqualified good, I have to teach you that we only have names for something like 5% of the globe's fungi. So we have names for something like 100,000 of what we think are between 1.5 and 10 million species. So just get the sense that, that most of the things you're looking at when you're looking at fungi are undescribed. And it's a lot of work to describe species. I don't do it myself, I hate it. Um, and so there's a lot of biodiversity that just goes undescribed. It's just unknown. We just don't have names for it. It's not a. It's not in our human. In our our human. Um, it's not within reach of humans. Um, it's just undescribed. And we know from plants, for example, that that biodiversity is threatened. But when you do an analysis, and I'm not going to go into the details of this analysis, what you find is that whereas we can say that something like 15% of plant species are imperiled, very few fungi appear to be imperiled. So if you look at formal records within conservation biology resources like NatureServe, you just don't find a lot of information about fungi. But it's not because fungi, well, there's two options formally, right? Either fungi are not in trouble and they're not in trouble and they're fine, or we just know so little about them that we can't do the work to document that they're in trouble, um, even though they might be in trouble. And of course, one part of the conversation when you're talking about trouble and biodiversity in our planet is invasive species. And again, everyone seems to know about garlic mustard, right? Everyone's out there picking garlic mustard. Um, it's a problem. We acknowledge it as a problem. I would challenge you to think about an invasive fungus that's not a disease. We care about diseases because they kill plants and animals. But think about something that's not a fungus that's not a disease that's invasive in Maine. It must be there, but you don't know about it. I don't know about it. It's it's just un, unrealistic to think that that's not happening. And then back to this story. Now we're looking at the death caps again, and and these and um, that are invasive in California. When you go to a so so if you've walked in, I know you all have walked in the woods in Maine and fall, and you see this incredible diversity of mushrooms. Just an astonishing um, diversity of. I have a friend who has a farm near Demerascada, and it's like a wonderland to go there and collect fungi. But in the forests where the death cap is invading in California, these are the kinds of data that we collect. So here are two forests. Red is the number of mushrooms or sporocarps, the biomass, that's the death cap. And black is the other actomycorrhizal fungi. So in one forest, um, over 60% of the mushrooms we collect of that biomass is death cap. And in another place, it's more than 80%. So while I cannot prove to you at this point, because of the complications of working with fungi, that native fungi are in trouble because of the spread of the death cap, I feel that data like these suggest great caution. It's, I don't know of very many ha habitats on our planet where um, consistently year after year, all you find are one species of mushroom. All, you know, here all you find are death caps. It's just, uh, it's just a crazy dynamic. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that I think this, that we should be concerned about um, introducing invasive fungi is because of the impact that they have on other ectomycorrhizal fungi that have co-evolved in our native forests. Okay, so that's um, my thought on invasive, on, on invasive fungi. And, and meanwhile, 
there's this amazing thing that I'm I'm witnessing where because mycorrhizal fungi are in the news, you know, I I don't know what's in the what's in the water kind of that we're all hearing about them. Um, there's a growing idea, and for example, I talk about it with the arborists who take care of my trees here in Wisconsin, that we should be buying mycorrhizal fungi off the shelf of our garden stores or online um, at uh, uh, Ben Meadows or other, you know, other places. And we should be buying these fungi and we should be putting them with our plants because they will help our plants. The big plant, little plant experiment, clearly they're going to help our plants. Um, so we continue to buy and spread these fungi, even when the products make no sense. So here's a product that I found in Wisconsin. And in this same bag of soil, they're offering you mycorrhizal fungi so that you can have those fungus roots and a biofungicide. <laughs> so you're simultaneously adding fungi and killing fungi in the same product. And I think this, this like nonsensical craziness um, is possible because we're, we are never educated about fungi. So if we don't know anything about fungi and someone says, oh, this is a great thing, then uh, somehow we seem to think it's a good thing. And so we buy the product and we add the fungicide and the fungus at the same time. Um, so this dy dynamic um, led me to, I just wanted to see how, yeah, okay. Um, led me to um, put in a, a, a grant proposal to National Geographic where I wanted to, I wanted to engage in this work. I wanted to engage in this idea of mycorrhizal biofertilizers and um, and invasive species. And 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 the premise of this, um, one of my students at one point said to me, "I'm not sure I understand why people are are you know sprinkling these mycorrhizal fertilizers or about. It's like adding salt to the ocean." And I think that's true. Um, it's like adding salt to the ocean. You have lots of fungi in your soil. There's there's a, a colleague of mine who's who's gone all around testing every kind of soil for 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 mycorrhizal fungi. Always finds mycorrhizal fungi, even in soil that looks like it should be dead. There are mycorrhizal fungi there. So so um, so starting with this idea, we began these experiments, and they are in progress. I'm sharing unpublished results with you. Um, for various, and I would be, I would welcome questions about um, both the strengths and the weaknesses of the experiments that we're doing. Um, but the idea was to 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 try to understand one whether um, whether adding mycorrhizal fertilizers just test this idea if it's like adding salt to the ocean, um, and 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 two develop alternative strategies. So <clears throat> let's just start with the idea that sustainable, livable cities are green. We need shade trees. Um, we need all kinds of habitats for people to rest and relax in, for birds to be in, for insects, for all the kinds of biodiversity that we might foster in cities. Um, now you're looking at a map of Bogota, again in Colombia. This is where a lot of this work has been focused, although we have a parallel experiment in Wisconsin I'm not gonna talk about today. But that you know, let's just start with this idea that we really we, we do we do want greenery around us, and cities might be the most logical place where we might think that adding mycorrhizal inocular or mycorrhizal biofertilizers would would help. And so the question is, and here actually you're looking at a street tree not from Bogota but from Tanzania, and this street tree definitely looks like it needs help. Um, and and so the the question is 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 adding bio adding mycorrhizal fungi the kind of help that this poor little tree um needs um or and the and, and the alternative idea that we had was maybe instead of importing a mycorrhizal fun fungus from from europe to colombia to help um help trees grow um maybe and particularly or especially if we're using native species of shade trees or native species of street trees that using a little bit of whole soil from a nearby healthy tree to inoculate the tree that you're planting at planting would be a more effective local sustainable way um, to help that tree to grow if it needs fungi and if you've never heard of a fecal transplant humans when sometimes when they're very sick in the in the hospital um, with something called a c diff infection um, humans can be cured i know it sounds astonishing by either by eating a little bit of someone else's poop. 
I know that sounds crazy and gross, but actually it's um, decreased mortality rates um, by something like 95%. And the idea is that humans have bacteria inside us. We have what's called a microbiome. And in a C. diff infection, your microbiome has gone awry. And you, and But by getting a fecal transplant from a healthy person, like your spouse or sister, um, you can replace your microbiome and then you become healthy again. So this is the same idea that we're, we're this is the analog we're thinking of for trees. Maybe maybe we we need uh, the equivalent of a fecal transplant, but of course we're not using poop in this case, we're gonna use whole soil. All right, so the first thing we wanted to do, back to this idea of is it like sprinkling salt in the ocean, is look at both urban trees and rural trees of the same species to try to measure mycorrhizal colonization. In other words, to dig up roots, which is what you're, what we're doing on, in, in the photo on the left, to dig up roots and, and stain them um, with various kinds of stains and measure fungal colonization and compare that to the fungal colonization of trees. Um, and we're in Bogota of, of trees growing in a, nearby, in a nearby rainforest. And again, we, we did this work in Wisconsin as well. If you wanna ask me about that, we're still in the process of it. I'd be glad to talk about it. We're working um, primarily with Quercus humboldtii, which is called the Roble oak. Uh, and we are working in two kinds of surfaces. We're working in, in what are called in Bogota hard surfaces. So on the left, you see this tree growing um, you know, with just a little bit of soil in that concrete box surrounded by streets. That's a hard surface. And then in soft surfaces. So on the right, we're in the middle of a park. Um, where lots of people walk and bring their dogs, et cetera. And that's so it's a park like setting or a soft surface versus a hard surface. And again, the idea is to measure colonization in these cases and compare them to trees growing in the forest. Um, oh, sorry. And this is what I just said. The soft surfaces are on the on the left. Another example and hard surfaces on the right. Um, and so I'm going to get right to the data again. This is for Quercus humboldtii. And what we found is that um, the in the forest and in urban areas, urban areas have a greater range of colonization um, and are in fact different from the forest, um, the colonization of trees going in the forest. But we found something really interesting and unexpected, which is that actually, if you're a tree growing in a hard surface, so surrounded by streets and concrete, your colonization is um, equivalent to what a tree to the colonization of trees growing in the forest. And so that's, here's the colonization. You can see it's slightly above 80% is the mean for a forest tree. And in a tree growing in the middle of Bogota, which is a mega city of 6 million, 10 million people, I've kind of forgotten. Um, but those trees growing in, in concrete surfaces are just as colonized, which is um, was a surprising result for us. But trees and soft surfaces kind of are all over the place. Um, so they are, um, you know, they're they're sometimes not colonized at all, and sometimes they're very highly colonized. And our and our best guess as to what's going on here is that parks are places where both dogs and people pee, and pee has a lot of nitrogen in it. And we know um, that these fungi often disappear when you add uh, nitrogen. Um, and phosphorus NPK fertilizers. So we think what's going on is that in these um, park settings, the um, excess urea um, that these trees are getting are, are, uh, are, are preventing the fungi from growing. So, so to answer, is it like sprinkling salt in the ocean? Um, the answer in Bogota seems to be, well, it, it um, depends on the context of, of the tree. Um, however, it's also true if that if we're right in our idea that that's what's going on in parks, adding biofertilizers will not help um, because it won't prevent people from peeing. And actually, if you want fungal colonization to happen, you need to prevent dogs and people from peeing on the trees. Um, so, OK, so the, so so is it like sprinkling salt in the ocean? It, it can be. Um, anyway, none of this data suggests that the solution is is bio is biofertilizers is mycorrhizal um, fertilizers. So then the next test that we did um, is this idea of the soil transplant, the equivalent to the fecal transplant, where we took a little bit of soil from the forest and we, um, we, we grew those soil, we added those soils in an experiment to various kinds of plants that are destined. And these are, these are we were really lucky to be collaborating with the Bogota Botanical Garden 
um, because they grow the trees, <clears throat> excuse me, for the city of Bogota. And, uh, and, and so we were actually able to do this experiment on trees that are destined for planting in the city. Um, so they're about to be planted in the city in a few months and we'll be able to follow them hopefully for their for their entire lives to see whether this technology works. And I right, I right away um, want to point out this is work in progress. I'm not giving you firm conclusions, but also that that even though I think I'll give away the punchline, I think that this shows a lot of promise. This will not be sustainable if we all run around to forests and grab soil and and um, move them into cities, right? So, so the idea of a soil transplant may work, but one thing that we're thinking about very hard right now is is where where to get the soil for the soil transplants because it's it we can't just run into undisturbed forests all the time and um, and and grab soil that would that would be terrible. All right, so here's the experiment. We have a control. Nothing is done to those plants. We have this native soil treatment. The soil is coming from the rainforest nearby. We have a treatment that's just fertilizer the way that the Bogota Botanical Garden and the city of Bogota would typically plant their seedlings. And then we we um, decided to combine the native soil and fertilizer. We have six plants in each treatment and we're working with Quercus humboldtii again, this oak. And we're working with something that's called the native pine. It's not a pine at all. It, it, remember, it, the pines are not native here. It's a retrophyllum species. That's not a genus that's very familiar to us in temperate regions. And it's not a pine. It has nothing to do with pines. but uh, you know, I don't know why in English it got translated to native pine, but it's a retrophyllum species in the Podocarpaceae. Um, so um, this is a, a picture of, of La Florida, which is the nursery where all of the um, plants for the city are grown. And I just really want to formally thank the Bogota Botanical Garden um, for their great help. They were very curious and very open about this experiment. And, um, you know, ultimately anything that helps um, any of us get away from NPK fertilizers, I'm thinking about Ukraine right now, um, will help the help the planet. Um, and that's Natalia Vargas again, my great collaborator who who led these experiments. So what did we find? Well, you know, this is why you do experiments because you 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 think you know what's going on, and then you find this really surprising result. And basically, to cut a long story short, we found out that the the treatment that is the best for plant health is the treatment that involves both native soil and fertilizer. Um, and we could talk about how much fertilizer we're using. It's not much, it's Bogota. They don't have money to use a lot of fertilizer. Um, so, so that's, and that result of, of this combination um, has held up through, I'm showing you data um, almost through the full year and, and purple is the, um, is the native soil plus the fertilizer. And you can see um, that for, for things like, for me measurements of plant growth, like height or stem diameter, um, the purple is in general um, bigger, not at all time points, et cetera, but in general, it's, it's that treatment that does the best. So why do we think that's true? Uh, I just wanna check my time again. Well, our hypothesis is that what's going on is that if you just add fertilizer, the plant roots actually can't get at it super effectively. And if you just add native soil, there are fungi, but there are not a lot of nutrients for them to access. So the magic formula is fertilizer and fungi because you're adding nutrients and you're adding the tool that the plant uses to get at nutrients, which is the fungal mycelia. Um, so somehow adding that combination um, is really what helps the plants the most. It's kind of very unexpected result. And we'll see how it plays out again as these um, plants are taken out and, and put into the, um, into the city of Bogota. So, um, so just to, to give, end with this really big picture, it's, it's clear that fungal introductions lead to invasions. And that spread of the my, these mycorrhizal fungi, these big plant, little plant fungi, is historic, but it's also ongoing and potentially even increasing right now as we purchase and add these biofertilizers to soil. I want to acknowledge that by doing that, we are enabling the spread of invasive species. It's exactly the garlic mustard story. It's just that we're not used to thinking about fungi as being as having as being endemic, as having their own local biodiversity. Um, as it not, I mean, we would 
you know, nowadays really no one would plant garlic mustard in their garden. I, I'm going to put it out there. We would not do that. And yet we don't have that same sense of of if we move fungi around, maybe where it's the equivalent of, of, of planting garlic mustard. There's one species of fungus in particular, a gloma species that is the equivalent of, of garlic mustard. I think it's time to start talking about alternatives. And that's really what I am doing, hoping to do in conversations with you and with others is just start the conversation about fungal biodiversity, endemism um, and, and moving things around. And so I just I want to end my talk by giving giving some thank yous, particularly to Natalia Vargas. This is an image of her in the height of the pandemic doing the experiment, um, riding the minibus from her house to the nursery where the trees were and where she kept up the measurements throughout the whole pandemic. It was rather astonishing um, and wonderful. And then also my lab. Um, here are some of the people who have been involved in this National Geographic project along the way. And if you want to know more, I put a lot of time into creating talks that are available for you to stream on a platform called iBiology. And if you want to just see a basic talk about fungi or learn more about the death cap, um, there are recorded lectures there that are, um, I hope, engaging and, and easy to understand. Um, and with that, um, I'm going to just take it back to this picture, maybe, and I'd be super happy to talk with you and, and, and have a conversation. And I might end my screen sharing at the moment because just so I can hopefully see some people. Yeah, feel, yeah, feel free, free to that. do that. Yeah. Okay. So folks can feel free to post their questions in the chat. I did just post that link again to the iBiology site where Anne has her presentations um, <clears throat> linked. And I, I can say after having watched um, several of them myself, uh, it, it's well worth your time. Um, really uh, great information. So thank you, Anne, for, um, for sharing your work with us. I'm going to lead out and then I do see that we um, do have some hands raised too. But I was curious, uh, you referred to your work, um, the trials that you're doing in Wisconsin. What trees are you working with in those trials? We're working, um, we're working with oak species here as well. Um, and we're working with burr oak, which is where I am in Wisconsin, um, the landscape uh, 200, 300, 500 years ago would have been an oak prairie savanna um, with a few very old oak trees and then prairie all around it. And uh, so we're working with with the, that species of, of oak. And what, the, the, what we've been doing here is an, exactly the same as what we were doing in Bogota. So we've been comparing the colonization of the trees in in urban habitats, my backyard was one of our study plots, which was kind of great. It's the first time I've ever collected data from my backyard that might actually be published. Um, and and then also in in um, relatively undisturbed habitats in what's called the driftless area, which is uh, to the west of Madison. And what we're finding there is that there's no um, uh, there's no difference. Um, the colonization of the oaks that we have in my backyard is the same as the colonization of what we find in in Fesky natural area, you know, an hour away. So back to this theme of I, I do think, you know, back to this theme of is it like sprinkling salt into the ocean? Yeah, potentially. It seems like it might be. There's certainly there's no and it, what's really interesting is our, our one of our local tree companies will give you a year's warranty if they sell you a tree. They'll give you a five year warranty if you agree to purchase and add mycorrhizal fungi. Um, so that's another conversation that I'm trying to engage in is, is to, to say to this company, you know, why? Um, and I, I, I don't know why, I feel like, yeah, I'm not sure why that, that who did made that decision or why they thought it was a good idea, but it's clearly not necessary in the places around Madison. That's, that's really interesting. I have not heard of that. Um, we do have somebody with their hand raised, M. Mulvey. If you want to go ahead and unmute. I, I was just starting to type a question and I, I bought a bag of Fox Farms mycorrhizals, which is sold in Maine. And I bought it for a class to try to sort out with screen some of the um, endophytes. And 
we didn't find any, the screens weren't fine enough, but I used it to plant, start my plants the next year. And it was interesting because there were sap probes coming up in the soil. So not all of them, not all of, I don't, I don't even know how they control what fungi they put in those mixes. Yeah. This is a very familiar story. I, I have at this point, a few colleagues who've been trying to dig into those bags and see what's in it. Um, often there's nothing alive in it. Sometimes, shockingly, there's nothing alive in it, but there are fertilizers in it. So they add the fungus, but they also add NPK fertilizers. Um, so you're going to see an effect on your plant because it's fertilizer, not because of the fungus. Um, and then, you know, the, some of the fungi that they use are being bred. And I don't want to trash anyone's particular product, right? Let me just say that out loud. I'm, I'm sure that there are people who are doing this well and carefully. So I'm, I don't want to make a global judgment. Um, but I, I would, I would, I would urge a lot of caution. And again, just thinking about whether it's a local sustainable thing, like, is it a local farm that's giving you their compost tea from their compost that they made right there? Or is it, you know, a big box company that's decided that it can make this miracle invention? And, and I mean, there are a lot of, there are a lot of like really sharky salespeople. If you start Googling around the, on the web, you'll just be shocked at some of the promises that are, are made to you if you buy these various products. Anyway, yeah, your experience is exactly the experience of many people that I know. They're, you don't know what's in it. Um, and sometimes it's totally inappropriate what's in it. And it certainly doesn't match the label. I, I have one more question. What's the species of glomus that's equivalent to garlic mustard? Interradices, and you'll see it all over the place, Glomus interradices, and it's bred in petri dishes. And the issue with that is it's bred to grow quickly and sporulate a lot. Well, maybe the thing that's bred to pull carbon out of the plant as quickly as possible and reproduce as much as it can is not the thing that you want growing with your plant. I mean, that would suggest that it's really a carbon sink, right? It's, it's uh, you really want the thing that that is the best mutualist that's offering the greatest benefit, but that is not always aligned with um, the thing that will grow fastest in a petri dish. And I just think it's totally unexplored biology. No one seems to be even asking the questions exactly. There are, I mean, you, you know, my, I have a, a, my friend and colleague, Jim Beaver, in, who does a lot of work on prairie restoration. Um, just to say, I mean, he, ha you know, he has some strong thoughts about how to carefully um, breed mycorrhizal fungi but it's slow and and in prairie restoration but it's slow and painstaking and the kind of work that he's doing is is um is very is very different from what most people are encountering at their garden store and i had one more question where do where is glomus native to do we know or it's just no, in it's a real controversy actually there's a controversy on many levels first of all there's a lot of discussion about how to define how to define species and genera in the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. Um, so whether, whether how, how many, I mean, you, you, you might be astonished at how the taxonomy has changed in the last 15 years. All the names that I used when I was a graduate student, most of them are not relevant anymore. Um, and there's not a whole lot of stability there. And there's a lot of debate about, there's a lot of debate about it. Um, but the glomus interodices often that you're finding in, in those um, biofertilizers are, th are is a is a strain that someone has paid for mail you know and has been sent to them through the mail um it's not a thing that they have isolated out of their local soil thank you yeah you're welcome thank you Anne. there are a few questions that have come into the chat um so i'll start at the top um catherine Wampler wants to know do you recommend using fertilizer when planting fruit trees in our native soils and is there a way to test for fungi in our soil there is a way to test for fungi in your soil, but it's not easy. And I think that's the that gets back to this, which is really a fundamental problem. It's a really it's a it's a hard problem. Is that it's not unlike you know you can't see fungi, and it would take for for me to measure the roots of a a tree growing in your yard would take me a few days. I'd have to go. I'd have to sample the soil. I'd have to wash the roots out of the soil. I have to clear the roots of the pigments that they have. I have to stain them using, usually you do that using India ink, just fountain pen ink. Then I have to look at them under the microscope. I have to count the structures just to say that it's painstaking work. And that's part of the reason why, I, I, you know, I think we're in a bit of a mess is it's not easy. It's not easy. Um, as adding fertilizers, you know, I'm not an expert on planting fruit trees and, and adding fertilizers. Um, so I, 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 I 
I, um, I mean, of course, fertilizers will always help a, a plant to grow, um, but um, there are costs to the planet of using fertilizers. And I guess you could ask whether you might use compost, for example, instead of an NPK, you know, chemical fertilizer that's been intensively created um, using a lot of energy. Um, and I guess, you know, just personally, then, you know, not, in a kind of a hybrid way, not just as a scientist, I would encourage people to consider al alternatives to those those um, NPK fertilizers that are so intensive for our planet. Great. Um, the next one, do you have any suggestions on a database for fungi? In Vermont, they have started a fungal scientific advisory group to try and document the fungi in the state, not only macro fungi, but plant and animal pathogens as well. Yeah, I have a strong recommendation for that. Actually, I um, helped found a website called Mushroom Observer. Um, and Mushroom yeah. Observer is a great place to record, to start a project and record the biodiversity. You can get lots of people involved. So it's a community project. Um, and so I, that would be my strong recommendation. And of course, iNaturalist, which probably a lot of you already use. iNaturalist would be another great place to um, to turn to, to try to record mushroom biodiversity. So yeah, and I would encourage, yeah, I think it's an amazing, I mean, I think the more people who are out there and looking are, and recording the, I mean, that helps us so much, um, helps the community so much. And Mushroom Observer, we are about to launch an Etsy shop, just so you know. So very soon there will be Mushroom Observer swag. <laughs> <laughs> Another project I've been involved with with an undergrad for the last six months. That's fun. <clears throat> Um, could you talk about nursery stock and the risk of spreading fungal species? Some trees, nursery stock, I would say much of it that we get in Maine is procured from out of our state or our region. And is this a risk? Yes, it's a risk. Of course, it's a risk. Um, you know, they're, they're, uh, it's a risk and that's a, a sort of a bigger, um, a bigger risk, not just mycorrhizal fungi, right? I mean, diseases spread from tomatoes that are grown in southern climes and, and sold at big box stores. And um, so I think it, that's always a risk. Now, there I find it complicated to, to, to pontificate to anyone that they shouldn't buy a tree and plant it, you know, a tree from Home Depot and plant it. I buy trees and plant them myself. Um, if you have, if you, if you, I, now I'm just speaking as like a, a home gardener almost. Um, you know, if you have the option to to buy to buy local and plant local, uh, I I feel we should always choose that. That's always a better choice in the long term, um, and it is a risk. Um, would it prevent me always from planting a tree? No, honestly, not. So, <clears throat> and then. Um... A good follow up to that one, um, and I wouldn't necessarily expect you to comment on our state regulations, but are there state or federal regulations for mycorrhizal treatments for sale? I, I saw that come in the chat. No, actually, I'm very comfortable answering that question. Uh, to my knowledge, there are no regulations anywhere in the U.S. about moving mycorrhizal fungi around. I don't even think it's on the radar of, of uh, any regulatory person I've ever talked to. I work um, quite a bit with the, the northern um, the Northern Forest Research Station um, in Madison of the of the Forest Service and you know the the mycologists there yeah no there's no regulation um, and we all recognize that this is an issue but but there's absolutely it's absolutely the wild west there's no regulation there's no um, there's not even a hint of um, discussion of of gosh maybe you're lying um, and again I don't want to suggest that every company is I mean, I'm thinking about my friend Jim Beaver and his product that he's trying to use in prairie restoration. But the, but the, the, the issue is that since there's no regulation, you can have people who are doing trying to do the right thing all mixed up with a lot of people who see this as a fantastic opportunity to make money. Um, and you can see a lot. I mean, there's a lot of really troubling videos on the Web that make promises that are just are unrealistic in the extreme. So I think that was the end of the questions in the chat. We have five minutes left if, if folks want to think about that. Um, but I want to thank you, Anne. Um, just an incredible wealth of information. Um, so much packed in there um, <clears throat> for getting up early and taking the time with us here on the East Coast. Um, My pleasure. 
<laughs> I encourage everybody again to check out these other videos and, and um, keep track of Anne and her lab's work with uh, this. And I hope to invite you back, Anne, when you have some um, results, published res results that you can um, share with us. Yeah, thank you. And also there is, um, if, you, if people are interested in this idea of conservation biology and fungi, there was a great article in National Geographic um, that uh, I could, I think if you just Google National Geographic fungi conservation, um, you'll find it. And it, if you're interested and curious, it lays out some of these problems um, related to conservation and fungi. I will look that up and post it in the chat. In the meantime, Don, Mancy, I see you have your hand up and I'll turn it over to you. Uh, before I go, we've got one more question from Lisa Durrell. How do you know if the micro dot fungi in the purchase mix are alive? You don't. You have no idea. That's such part of that is you have. That's a great question. That is like the central question almost. Yeah. All right. I, I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Pringle for her outstanding presentation. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time from your schedule to, to do this for us. Um, if folks would like to know more about uh, Dr. Pringle's work, you can also search for Pringle Lab on the web and it pops right up. And I'd also like to thank the main Forest Service staff who made this Forest Friday possible. Our next Forest Friday will be on June 17th, again at 9 o'clock. The topic will be beech leaf disease, and our presenter will be Cameron McIntyre, who is a plant pathologist with the USD Forest Service. Uh, thanks to everybody who attended, and thanks, Anne. Yeah, pleasure.